the top of the hour and good afternoon everyone and from the looks of it everyone around the country is at afternoon now so welcome to the nnlm social determinants of environmental health webinar series we're glad you're able to join us today for the session um, understanding environmental health a social ecological model uh, featuring dr londetta jones i am april wright Outreach and Education Librarian at NNLM Region 1, and I'll be your host. Assisting with technical aspects is Molly Knapp from the NNLM National Training Office, and our chat monitors are Tiffany Chavis, Layla Johnson, and Miranda Cheatham. Okay, we have just a few, um, few little items to cover before we get started. We do have a live captioner today, and closed caption has been enabled and it's available by selecting show captions at the bottom menu. Depending on the size of your screen, you may need to click on the three dots where it says more and then select captions. All attendees have been muted, but we welcome your questions and comments in the chat at any time. Um, we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please be sure uh, to select everyone from the drop down menu when posting your questions and comments in the chat so everyone can see them. We are recording today's session, um, and it will be available um, on our on our website in a few places, uh, including on the on the accompanying series guide in about a month. As a reminder, by registering for this webinar, all attendees have agreed to abide by the NNLM code of conduct. It's a reminder that we are all here together professionally, and we want to be inclusive and respectful. Your cooperation is appreciated. The code of conduct is also available on our website and Miranda has put the link in the chat. This class is eligible for 1.5 Medical Library Association continuing education credits, uh, which you'll be able to claim through the evaluation link um, that will have the MLA CE code. We'll share that at the end of the session. Additionally, the session is also available for um, competencies for health education specialists, or CHES. Um, you'll just, just so you know, you'll need to have your uh, CHES ID to complete the evaluation. The session CE is also eligible uh, toward the Consumer Health Information Specialization, or CHIS, through the Medical Library Association. And speaking of that evaluation, your feedback um, does matter to us and it helps us improve future events. So please take a moment to complete it, whether you want a, um, a CE or not. Now, I know some of you are already familiar with us, but for those of us, for those of you who aren't, I'd like to share a little bit about who we are. Um, the National Institutes of Health is the nation's leading medical research agency. Um, many of you might be more familiar with the National Cancer Institute, which is one of the many national institutes um, and centers at NIH. The NLM, or the National Library of Medicine, is one of the 27 institutes and offices of the National Institutes of Health. It's the world's largest biomedical library and produces online resources like PubMed and Medline Plus. NNLM the network of the National Library of Medicine is the outreach program of NLM, working to ensure health professionals and the public have equal access to health information. NNLM is made up of seven regional medical libraries, three national offices, and four national centers, all providing training, funding, and engagement opportunities to over 9,000 NNLM member organizations. And this is a map of the uh, of the NNLM network, we are divided. There are the seven regions. Um, if you'd like to learn more about your region um, and how your organization can become a part of this network, you can visit our website at nnlm.gov. And Miranda has put that link in the chat. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Londetta Jones. Dr. Jones is an associate professor at the University um, of Maryland School of Medicine, where training, education, and research are among her professional activities. While her early research career focused primarily on the laboratory bench, 
studying genetic and environmental causes of breast cancer, she always had a heart for community connections. Her unique background and training in the biomedical sciences and public health guides her current research efforts to address health disparities through understanding the interplay of biological, environmental, and social factors. She leads a transdisciplinary research lab that seeks to build, build meaningful and trusting relationships between diverse groups working together to produce comprehensive and context-specific strategies for reducing health disparities. Welcome, Dr. Jones, and I will turn it over to you. Let me stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you so much, April, to you and to all the organizers who invited me to participate in uh, this wonderful series. So I'm going to start to share my screen. Um, yeah, so environmental health sciences is really something near and dear to me and where I received my uh, doctorate degree at Johns Hopkins. And, and so that's another reason why I'm so glad to come back and participate, but also now to bring a lens into what I've learned through public health and uh, my community partners and engagement. And so to begin, just in case you miss anything uh, of the messages, the details, I just wanted to bring this in the forefront that the libraries, as many of you probably already are aware of, are well positioned to play a key role in reducing neighborhood level health disparities. Um, part of that larger uh, group that I recognize is important for reducing health disparities and working as a team. Now, just wanted to check in. I see my screen freezing, but I still hope you can hear me. So let me know if I uh, sort of phase out a bit. We can hear you. Okay, awesome. So there were a couple objectives here that I'm going to take time to break down, but hopefully um, what I'm gonna do today is to, uh, as uh, April mentioned at the beginning, uh, my, my work is really looking at the interplay of health disparities, but not just simply at the individual level, but the social and the environmental levels and all of these various uh, factors that impact health. And, and I'm going to use kind of a social ecological model lens to do that. And then um, kind of at the end, talk about why integrating interventions, multiple interventions um, from various multi-sectors uh, is, is important to really reduce environmental health disparities and how working together can be so, so effective. All right, so for starters, I said a lot in both the title and those objectives, but I just wanted to kind of define a few terms for you. And the first one is, um, you know, so, so what's environmental health sciences? I know we've been hearing about it a lot in this series. Many, many of you may already know, but, but just to kind of bring everybody on board uh, in environmental health, I, I like this diagram that's uh, shared by a group called the Frameworks Institute. I don't know if many of you have heard of this group. We've become, you know, quite a great friend of mine. Uh, because it's it's a multidisciplinary team of social scientists who also work with persons in communication uh, to really try to investigate patterns in public thinking and how people understand social issues. So, you know, environmental health is, is really a big term. Even when I was studying this as a uh, PhD student, it, it meant so many things to different people. And what Frameworks has done was really kind of pull all this together into this, this swamp. I don't know if it's the best world, but, but just to kind of understand that people, when you start to talk about environmental health, it's looked at very differently. And some of these I'll just name is, you know, of course, certainly we think of, you know, contamination, threats to food and water. Uh, but, you know, there's also persons who, who look at the environment as, um, you know, it's it's the black box. You know, how, how does it work? What are environmental health persons trying to do? And, you know, some people take for granted. And then there's others who up here in the top corner about, yes, everyone is responsible. And, 
you know, some who are against the government and, and the business and, and, and you name it. But many people come from really a lot of different directions when uh, the topic of environmental health is discussed. But for our purposes today, um, really, it depends on who you ask, what is environmental health? But the definition we'll use today is, you know, of course, is a branch of public health that monitors the relationship between human health and the environment, examining aspects of both our natural and man-made environment and their effect on human well-being and ultimately their health. So, <clears throat> so what is the social ecological model of health? You know, when I was a PhD student, much of our work in the biomedical sciences was just focused on, you know, really trying to eliminate disease. And, you know, for those on the extreme end, it's, you know, health is about, you know, trying to get perhaps a, a, a model that is not working well to, to, to work. But, but as we, you know, fast forward, we recognize health is not simply the absence of disease, but guess what? Health is rather complex, and, and as one group puts it, health is a complex adaptive system. And while many of our healthcare systems and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, certainly the drugs we make target the individual level, there's even determinants at the individual level. There's, there's age and gender and beliefs, but, but that person, individual, doesn't live in a bubble. Matter of fact, they have a social environment that impacts them, both within their community, their culture, whether they have high income, low income. Um, and, and that community is really structured around this built environment of whether it's, you know, some, I was looking in the chat, seeing that you come from all over the US, some may be in urban cities, some maybe more in areas that are, um, you know, in, in, in spaces with more land use or different transportations and more green spaces. And then of course about our natural environment where that's layered in the weather, the water and the air quality. And so when we think of the social ecological model of health, particularly it is complex and, and, and we'll talk more on this later, but we're gonna focus mainly on this top portion here, which is the natural and the built environment and how that can be impacted by the various layers. So this one last I'll kind of share with you was really what I just explained about how oftentimes in our health models, we think of the individual, um, but that you know there's these overlapping rings in the model that illustrates how one influences the other. And as a public health, environmentalists um, who works with many communities, I start to think about these individual people that live in communities and their relationship with their schools and, and their, their environments and, and their communities and the society, uh, because all of these things impact whether a person is healthy or not. And this model suggests that, as I mentioned before, to ultimately achieve optimum health, it's really going to be necessary to act across these multiple levels of the model at the same time, back to this idea of partnering with various persons that exist at these various levels of this social ecological model. So what about social determinants of health? Many of the prior speakers or, or some of them may have spoken about this. Um, I, I wanted to just share with you how I sort of see this big word of, you know, the social determinants of health or things that are really outside of um, maybe the biology that we're thinking about of health. And so it's, it's been broken down in, into, um, if you think about a stream, and so there's, there's uh, the downstream elements, these health outcomes that you hear about uh, in disease states, whether uh, I highlighted cancer because that's my specialty focus. Um, certainly COVID-19 came into play and we had to consider that. But then there's these midstream determinants of health of, you know, perhaps who 
were more likely to be susceptible to COVID-19 in the first place, or even, you know, cancer, and, and who's more susceptible to heart disease. And we're finding that things such as living environments and employment status and health literacy uh, and exposure to toxin also play a role in uh, many of the downstream health outcomes that we're seeing. And then a lot of the things that oftentimes are at the structural level is what we call upstream determinants of health. And those are things such as racism and discrimination and social policies. So these are just context-specific examples of the social determinants of health that can also impact you know, a person in their space of health. And so this next slide I'm, I'm going to use to kind of pack uh, some things together and zero in on the areas that we are uh, hopefully in, it's going to be important. And so when we think about environments, and I told you about the built and the nature environment, um, a while ago, the CDC, in collaboration with other groups, uh, put out this really nice diagram of trees. And um, the caption was, what, so, so what do we know already? Well, I know um, that our environments cultivate our communities, and our communities nurture our health. And now while you're looking at these two trees and some things may be a bit tiny for you, what, I, what, I, what you can see without even reading is that there's a big stark difference between these two trees. And certainly the one on the left um, being uh, has no leaves, uh, it's kind of bent over, a bit scraggly. And of course the one on the right is, is really the tree that, that is flourishing. Um, and, and so what, what is here at the bottom here is really um, what I'm labeling as those, those built-in natural environmental factors, such as um, poor quality schools, if we look at the tree over here, and segregation and, and, and poverty and adverse living conditions. And so what we see is in the leaves or where the leaves could be within the tree that doesn't have a lot of leaves or any leaves, there are certain conditions and diseases, such as heart disease and stress and infant mortality and violence and smoking. And these are health outcomes that were often um, largely built upon many of these environmental factors, the built and the natural environmental factors that often gave rise to many of these health outcomes. And this caption above this tree says, when Inequities are high and community assets are low. Health outcomes are the worst. But what's interesting over here is that our tree to the right that has all these flourishing leaves have exactly the same health outcomes like the stress and obesity and, and violence, but, but they really are small and they pale in comparison to, you know, the striking um, statistics that we hear about often arising from some of these environmental factors. And, and what we see here is that the, at the roots of what's creating um, perhaps the less uh, poor health, health outcomes are things like um, health insurance and quality housing and clean environment and access to health care and, and, and quality schools. And so in this caption over here, it's saying when inequities are low, and the community assets are high, then health outcomes are best. And so let's just take a look at our tree again, because um, what we were just looking at was in the roots were things of these natural and built-in environments. And if we think of those as the roots or you know, part of the story, because some of those um, things that were in the roots were also some of the structural levels too. But, but if we find that in our natural and built environment, those are factors that determine the health, then how can we sort of um, alter or intervene in some ways to strengthen our natural and built environments to help to improve one's health in this complex adaptive system?
So this one paper, uh, a group from uh, College Park, Dr. Devin Payne Sturgis, um, her and uh, Dr. Gee wrote this really nice article uh, called Environmental Health Disparities, a Framework Integrating Psychosocial and Environmental Concepts. And so, um, as I mentioned before, really the subject of this talk is that recognizing that the elimination of disparities in environmental health is, is really going to require attention to, to both the environmental hazards, but also bringing in those social factors that I had talked about in the streams and conditions. And so what they had put together was sort of a framework, and, and, and they thought about the challenges of, you know, well, how do we understand how social processes may interrelate with environmental toxicants? And hopefully by, by sort of putting this into some kind of framework, we can understand why some groups experience greater illness compared with other groups and potentially start to integrate some of the knowledge that we know into divine, designing these um, comprehensive and perhaps context-specific interventions is really going to improve health. And so I... Well, just wanted to pull out one of the diagrams from this paper, and it might be a little mind-bending for some, but I'm, I'm going to try to walk you through it um, in a way that can hopefully uh, drive home the point of how these social factors and environmental factors can uh, blend together. So on this uh, right side here is a uh, box that I highlighted, and uh, for simplicity, these could be any environmental hazard, whether it's uh, chemicals in the water, something in the air, something in the soil. And this is uh, the level of community that we're exposed to. So hopefully um, our air is clean and our water is clean, but in certain communities, they are um, disproportionately exposed to a lot of environmental hazards and pollutants that really shouldn't be the case. And this exposure here going down to the second box, what we find as um, uh, biologists and toxicologists, this is now at the inside. So, so the things we see on the outside, the environmental hazards, we as toxicologists take perhaps these uh, biological samples, maybe blood, maybe urine, and we try to understand, well, what's, what, how much are these people being exposed to? What's the, the, the dose? And then in the center of it all here is that, you know, for persons that are um, already perhaps in maybe disinvested communities, like our tree that was over to the less, they are undergoing um, perhaps social factors that's causing an additional level of stress. And so if you can imagine combining some of the individual stressors, which we'll take a peek at in a minute, with an environmental side, you start to get multiple layers. So what are some of those individual stressors that we're thinking about? Well, I put over here on the side, um, again, that individual right here that's being exposed to those chemicals. Well, if we take kind of the curtain back and take a look at their um, relationships, say for example, this is you know a cancer survivor, the work that I work in. Well, that cancer survivor, oops, sorry, let's go back. Um, the cancer survivor is now um, maybe in one of the communities that had the tree with the, um, you know, maybe poor quality schools or, you know, lack of places to, uh, to get healthy food. Um, there's neighborhood resources that might be low, community stressors, structural factors, all really often based sometimes, as they say, uh, looking at zip codes and, and where people live. So this is not for a test for you to take home and remember all these uh, sort of levels. But, but I just wanted to kind of bring to your attention about how some of the social factors at the community level, at the society level, that we see 
on the outside, and, and we call this community level vulnerability or, or things that you can see, how we couple that with the individual level vulnerability. So a person that may have a biological composition that may not be able to handle stress in a way that is um, you know, effective in warding off um, some of the stresses that we naturally face in communities. So again, a busy slide, but with all of these things kind of swirling around, the, the question is, you know, well, well, how do we how do we even combat this? How do we start to begin to work together? And 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 what I wanted to share with you is that, you know, it, because it is so complex, that one person alone cannot possibly um, come up with a solution by themselves. And it really requires teamwork. And so moving on to intervention. So, so if the problem is as complex as we are considering, what are some thoughts about the interventions? Well, what is an intervention for those who may not know? Um, it's, it's really in, in a word action taken to improve a situation. And, um, you know, in the medical world, the way we look at interventions is, is really um, at this level of disease. So we're trying to intervene or interrupt the usual sequence of disease. So for us, we're looking at this exposure to maybe a chemical and we're looking at, you know, all right, somebody has been exposed to maybe lead or some toxin and we can measure the blood levels to see what kind of changes are happening and are there any symptoms that are, that are arising from it. Um, and, and we can start to think about, well, what is the stage of disease? And at the end of the day, um, will whatever we're doing to try to treat that disease cause some type of recovery? Will it maybe do partial uh, healing to perhaps make it palliative care or disability? Or will any kind of exposure lead to death? And so all of these things are happening on the biology side, but that's only one, one part of the story. And so when, when I thought about interventions as I, you know, moved from the lab to actually the public health world, I started to recognize, well, well there's certainly interventions that are disease specific that I outlined to you in that, um, in that diagram on that prior slides where, where, again, it's going back to that absence of health and, you know, taking a look at high risk groups and, you know, strategies focus on individuals and, uh, really the responsibility for that complex work to measure levels of blood and, you know, uh, pathology in the tissues. Yeah, this, this is often, you know, trapped within those who um, are, are in the health field that, that have even the equipment to study. But then, as I'm recognizing, there's, there's the health promotion side, and, and that's really where we all can play a role in things like, well, health is, is a positive multidimensional concept and, and it's a participatory model of health, meaning that it's, it's not just coming from perhaps the experts or, or the doctors, but the partnership with those who are impacted by the disease. Um, and it's aimed at the total population not only just the individuals, but the surrounding environments. And many strategies and many sectors can participate in this point, not just the health professionals or those who may have studied toxicology and can start to measure internal doses. So I wanted to focus on the health promotion because that's where I see really every all hands on deck and even all of you who work in the library systems. So as I mentioned, health promotion now is the process that enables people to increase control over 
and to improve their health. So um, I've been sharing this little ecological model. It's the same one. You don't have to read the, the many uh, you know, writings, but, but what it's doing is we're moving beyond the individual level towards all of those kind of layers that I spoke about before. And so that could mean there's people intervening at the public and the policy level. There are various organizations within communities that are partnering together. There are families and friends and social networks that are all working towards promoting health. All right, so we're gonna take a pause to breathe <laughs> and recap. I know I dumped a lot of information on you, um, but now this, this last stretch of our journey, I, I just wanted to kind of zero in and um, sort, of, sort of really kind of um, show how these, how these multiple levels can, can work. Sticking a pin for a minute in my biomedical head where we do think about, uh, you know, blood levels and, you know, toxins and things of that nature and, and things that need equipment to measure. But how can, you know, communities and, you know, using a participatory approach. So, so let's just recap real quick. So back to our model. Well, if we know that there's uh, these health outcomes that can be pretty strong on the left side that is, you know, fueled by built in environmental factors that are either poor quality, um, anywhere from institutional racism to unemployment. And, and, and we know the side over here that can know that when assets are high, health outcomes are death. You know, what we're, you know, considering our model, what are inter interventions might work in partnership with those that seek to reduce environmental health disparities. Well, I wanted to, um, you know, kind of focus on one area that I didn't really highlight before. So I'm a big nature buff, and um, I really love what nature, I, I really think nature got it all figured out. <laughs> we can learn so much from our natural environment and in this tree. So one of the things I did talk about that I'm gonna highlight here in a minute is, is, is taking a look at the trunk. So if you think about the tree trunk, you know, its main purpose is to raise and support the leaves and the limbs above the ground, enabling this tree to reach the light to survive. So I highlighted this yellow part of support because actually that's, that's the work that I'm doing now within my lab and in partnership with community partners that the part that were the assets here are creating the sense of communities, establishing those social networks and providing the social support and um, environments and leadership and organizational networks that will help <clears throat> If we're able to create um, within perhaps communities that, that are um, unfortunately has disinvestment and disconnected members. So really the other thing that I notice is, 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 is that within these communities, what maybe isn't seen often and doesn't really get placed in the news is that there's many, many amazing people in communities that have stories of hope, that even have solutions to some of the most pressing problems, that if just work in partnership with uh, communities that may have uh, social networks and organizational networks that can provide the support, we can start to begin to build bridges and what I like to call building bridges between hope and opportunities. And, and that's really um, the, the basis of my lab. You know, how do we create these community and academic partnership to, for lack of a better word, play well in the sandbox together? <laughs> to bring together the resources, the, the value, the experiences of the communities with perhaps 
and various institutions with expertise. And blending these letters, uh, levels together to create <clears throat> a bridge of support. Now, this is something that um, I know many persons within the academic world are, are, are starting to do. Um, it does take time, but I feel it's so well worth it. And what I find is at the end of the day, as you're starting to build this capital, this social capital, um, you start to go to start to build things like human capital, cultural capital, financial capital, and all the way to building a healthy, vibrant community with <clears throat> a vital economy. And so this is, at the end of the day, what a picture might look like. But to do this takes teamwork um, and one person can't do it alone. So what I'd like to think of capital that may not always be considered a lot, especially in our uh, biomedical and academic models, uh, is like community anchor institution. And as I said at the beginning of the slide here, there's our library. Our libraries, um, as many of you may already know, are amazing anchor institutions. And I'll just share with you, um, including our schools and, and our churches, I'll share with you one article um, that, uh, and, and the references are there as well, but they actually talked about public libraries as partners in health promotion and how um, these are institutions that are free and accessible to all centers of community engagement and education, already promoting health literacy and understanding of health information, things that libraries do also well. And so the following slides, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of how public libraries were supporting and, and being part of um, the public health inspired programming to improve health. Maybe these are some things that you all could be doing in your library. So the question, you know, how can public libraries mitigate place-based disparities in population health? Well, there were some that actually hosted and implemented targeted interventions right within their libraries. Um, some most recently COVID-19. Um, some even had uh, addiction services. Um, there are some working with the whole idea of uh, response to the opioid overdose and harm reduction. There were other libraries that looked at ways to provide training for um, occupations and helping persons to seek <clears throat> and assist with job seeking and disaster relief, um, having services that have tornadoes and floods and hurricanes and places to meet to recover during periods of civil unrest. And again, this, this article actually gave references in case anybody's interested in, you know, maybe replicating or, you know, developing some of these strategies. Um, and then this last slide here is, is about places for food. And I, I know some libraries that I participated in uh, to promote healthy eating and food literacy. Um, as well as uh, bringing early life education to youth. And so, again, there's, there, there's a myriad of ways to kind of think about um, the ways in which libraries can play a huge role in mitigating place-based disparities, um, maybe things that we haven't thought about. I recognize that if one only uses the health model as from the biomedical lens that I know so very well, one may not really kind of think about the box, about how they might be participating in, in health. And so one last example that I'll give you of, of, sort, of sort of understanding um, really a practical way of how libraries were such a help and I'm going to give you one family story of how a library was an anchor, community anchor institution to this family. And 
I don't have to look far because actually that's that's my family. So that's me over to the left. <laughs> I was raised in Prince George's County um, back in the 70s. I was the youngest of three. My dad, um, he didn't he didn't really finish high school. Actually, when his family came here to uh, Washington, D.C. to live, because he didn't have a high school degree, he decided um, to get a job with the National Park Service, uh, where he started off planting flowers. And, you know, that that was his job. And he didn't make over, you know, $25,000 a, a year, really, uh, up until his, his um, untimely uh, death. But for me, you know, I was thinking about, I, I, well, I tell you, I wasn't thinking about college. In fact, you know, I was, my goal was to be a secretary because I really loved to type. And, and I really didn't think beyond the idea of, of future careers. And, but interestingly, now back to how this story ties in, well, the other thing that, I had encountered um, was actually housing instability. So anywhere from living in a tent, a motel, the basement of a church, relatives, we having a dad with low income and working with a government job that often had furloughs, um, we often found ourselves homeless at separate times. But, but, Back to the story of the hope meets opportunity and how might this tie into a library, you ask? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> Glad you asked. So back to our interventions. So, so what was the interventions in the libraries in the 70s and 80s? I found, and I don't know if many of you remember the bookmobile. The bookmobile was a lifesaver for us. Um, many times, you know, again, being homeless, not having toys to play or shelves to put them on, we had books. And this bookmobile would provide us with so many books. My favorite was, you know, Choose Your Own Adventure. Um, that developed my love for reading, right? The other part was coupon swap. So I'm, I'm dating myself, but back in the day, Libraries used to collect coupons when we used to cut them out before everything became electronic, but there was a coupon swap. And I remember many a Saturdays when my family and I would take time to sit. I mean, they had buckets and buckets of coupons, and my mom would place a bucket in front of each of us <laughs> to go through, and we would look for coupons. I mean, come now, that's an economic intervention that often saved our family. And again, if you ever noticed one of those families that was in the line with a whole lot of coupons, that was my family. We didn't have a lot of money, but thank God for a library that looked out for coupon collection and swaps. And then finally, the location of the library. So the library we went to was located in a shopping center. So why was that important to us? We could grocery shop, wash clothes, because there was a laundromat in there, and get books. So this was really, um, the library became the center of, of our world, and, and which I am internally grateful for. But those are the kind of things, again, when, when you think about thinking out of box areas of, of how we're actually contributing to a health of a family, all of these things, education, economics, um, just really providing a safe space is everything. And so for that, I'm grateful. So again, back to the take-home message, um, I really feel that finding ways to integrate interventions to reduce environmental health disparities, as I talked about, into this multi-social ecological model is most effective. Um, and and thinking about not just health as the absence of disease, but working with partners, including libraries, which have an extensive population outreach um, to diverse people um, being geographically placed in a favorable position and, and having a multi 
sectoral strategy to advance population health, um, working together in teams uh, to really address health disparities in a comprehensive and yet context-specific way. So I'll just end with a couple references um, from uh, the slides. Um, I'm happy to share them uh, with you. I Hopefully, uh, some things that I said kind of stirred some ideas, maybe some things that you're already doing, um, or some new ideas of what you might like to do. But with that, I will stop and say thank you so much uh, for your time and attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones, for that great presentation. Um, we do have, look at it. There, okay, there's one question that came through. It says, how do you adjust for disproportionately poor health outcomes in resourceful communities? Hmm. Um, tell me, tell me a little more. I, I think I understand what you're saying, but if, if you can give a little bit more context to that question, if it's possible, I don't know if you want to mute okay. or explain in the chat box. Um, um, Janice, do you want to unmute? Or maybe she's typing in the chat box. <laughs> okay, we can go on to another question then. Okay. Yes, we do have one. Did you see the question from Kate April? Oh, you can read that. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay, bear with me because... <laughs> There, there's a word in here that doesn't, uh, you know, come off the tongue easily. But uh, Kate says, great talk. Um, she'd love to hear your thoughts on the concept of exposing the integrated complication of all physical, chemical, biological, and social or psychosocial influences that influence biology and exposomics, if I'm saying yeah. <laughs> I know um, that's that's a that's a new word on top of all of our other ohms. Um yeah. pronounce exposome. I'm still trying to wrap that around my head uh my <laughs> myself. But but thank you, thank you so much for that question. So yeah, so, she, she's asking are psych, uh psychosocial and social factors sufficiently addressed in exposomics research initiatives like all of us yeah yeah um that's a that's a great question um what i understand about this uh exposome is that i recognize uh part of the challenge even in my toxicology world was that if i was interested in chemical x and i thought the world of it because i was looking at you know this aflatoxin B1, and I studied hard, but guess what? We live in a world that's big, and there's so many different exposures. So as I'm being exposed to this chemical, I'm drinking water, and I'm exposed to this chemical over here, and I'm breathing in the air. And so the idea was, uh, for those who are not familiar with the exposome, you know, what is, what is the whole mixture of exposures that we're being exposed to? And that's even layered on top of what I just told you <laughs> about now integrating the social and all of those other environmental causes. So again, that's a great question. I, I think definitely for the environmental world, we need to understand what is the totality of exposures that we are being exposed to. So that's one. Now, have I seen someone actually take that um, mix of these are all the exposures that we're being exposed to, and now this is a kind of soup mix over here, and now layering that on someone's social 
uh, communities and different levels and kind of the stresses that I was talking about in the model. Um, I think what all of us is trying to do is trying to take a peek at lifestyle factors, for example. Um, and whether they're integrating that with the exposures, the toxicology, that's going to take a really, really expert statistician and some bioinformatic um, kind of kung fu jujitsu, I think, to really figure that out. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, what I even learned with, with even chasing after my chemicals is um, everything is context specific, right? Um, I was looking at the various places that everybody's from and what chemicals I might be influenced by here in DC may not be the same as 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 my friend um from who typed in from Puerto Rico or or even you know maybe Virginia. So so I think at the end of the day, um what and, and this may not be answering your question or maybe just trying to navigate the understanding is is that we know we just can't pick one thing, like this is the thing we need to go after. But, but I do think that um, we should consider the exposures for which we do have evidence that we know that might be killing people, <laughs> stop that. <laughs> but then find how do we partner and um, sort of adjust our resources our institutions um, towards more of a health promotion model in a way that we don't have to worry about these exposures in the first place. And you know that's that's not an answer. I but but I I find this complicated. I don't have an answer yet. Um, but I am in the business of bringing people together to have those conversations. And really, that's where I see my role into how do we impact that, if that helped. <laughs> we have another question that came up. Um, this one is from Joanne, and hopefully I get this right. So she's involved with an initiative where they just got $10 million and a potential lease with University of Minnesota physicians, but church leadership took her idea and ran off with it without a focus on the root problems to improve health outcomes. So she's asking, how can she redirect uh, when the powers that be can't see the forest? For the trees. Sure. <laughs> um, we may have to talk offline about that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I guess I would I would have to have to learn more about um, the the project and the partners. Um, I I do a lot of work with um, community organizations, and uh, I've learned some lessons. And I do feel there's ways to work together, but it, it 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 sounds to me that that might be an offline conversation that I would love to um, kind of help you unpack that we probably wouldn't be able to <laughs> get that um, kind of solution right here in in the space and time. But but thank you for that. Yeah, um, we're not done yet. Um... We have another question from Janice, if it's the same one. Um, do you integrate provider bias in as well? Hmm. Um, great question. I'm, I'm just multitasking and putting my uh, email in the chat. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, definitely um, send that number uh, to my email. So do I integrate provider bias? Um, well, I actually give a lecture um, from the, you know, the National Academies of Medicine long, long ago, back in the 90s, kind of did a whole um, kind of deep dive into that and finding the evidence for provider bias and uh, different things. 
I, I again feel that it is really context specific because at the same time, um, I, I recognize that there are some maybe providers that are biased and then there are some that are not. So what, what to integrate into the model is um, to try to um, work with communities, groups that um, can then sort of come together and talk about, well, what are the things that maybe they're seeing in their communities at uh, the level of a hospital or you know, clinic and, and, and trying to understand, um, should we insert provider bias into our model? Because maybe we don't have that here. Maybe we had that back in the 70s and 80s, but it's not there now, but these are some of the other factors. So I think, I, I, I think the take home is, is that there's, there's guides, there are a lot of determinants. Do we dump all of them in there? Mm, maybe, maybe not, but what I think that we can start to be, use these to begin the conversation. Yeah. All right, I've got um, one other question. Hopefully I pronounced this appropriately. I apologize if I missed a mark. This is from Fund Me, and she's asking, do you know of any resources that speak to the prevalence of awareness of health issues that have traditionally uh, uh, disproportionately impacted racial and ethnic minority groups, even in the presence of many protective factors? Are there non-traditional risk factors to be considered? Hmm. All right, could you, could you just read that one more time? Because I, I, I got Sure, of... sure. Um, do you know of any resources that speak to the prevalence or awareness of health issues that have traditionally dis disproportionately impacted racial, ethnic, minority groups, even in the presence of many protective factors? Are there non-traditional risk factors to be considered? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to put a resource in the chat box, and I don't know if I actually included that on my slide list, but I, I put it in the chat box. There is a group, um, I'm just going to share my screen real quick, uh, they're called the AAMC Center for Health Justice. This is uh, the American Academy of Medical Centers. They have really brought together a an amazing resource of information um, that is pretty phenomenal. I mean, it even goes beyond medicine, but of course they have a medical focus. But I really turn to them now because they, they have a lot of great resources that look at improving health across communities um, at the biological or the social level. Um, so I would, I would you know, go um, use that as as one one go to um, that's that's reliable and gives a lot of great information. Um, there are others off the top of my head. I'm I'm forgetting, but I do and have over the years gathered lists of different groups that I had started to find are compiling some really some really great and helpful information. But that's just one that you know came to mind right away uh, because I just use that recently to put together a lecture. But I, I definitely know there's more. Well, that's all the questions I caught. Uh, well, I have to tell you that uh, fun me, she actually said she used to work there, but she didn't say no. <laughs> <laughs> OK, great, great. Um, April, was there anything else? Did I miss any, do you think? I think I got them all, though. Um, Layla, did you, I didn't see any more. Layla, did you find any that were not addressed? Those are the, all the ones I've seen. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, um, we can go to our, um, we can try the discussion. There are a lot of us here. We're going to try this without going into breakout rooms. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll see how this goes. I think we can handle it. 
<laughs> okay. All right, everybody. So these these hopefully will be uh, painless questions, um, but I really love to hear hear your feedback. And and thank you all so much for your question that you've asked so far. Um, what what I just wanted to do was just sort of explore this area. Um, you know, I, I brought to this discussion, and many of you may have already felt that libraries could be a really uh, uh, a, a force that can help um, to integrate strategies to mitigate environmental health disparities. And, and these are, you know, we talked about the health promotion versus disease uh, prevention um, and creating supportive environments, which again, I gave you examples about this coupon swap that who knew that was a lifesaver for my family. Um, and many of you may be developing personal skills, strengthening community action, building health, po public policy, reorienting health services. But um, for starters, I just wanted to kind of think about this, this, you know, two questions. And one, I would love to know, um, you could put in the chat box, uh, have you heard of the social ecological model before this session? Um, and you, that could be an easy yes or no. Uh, and if you have or you have not, um, what is something that, you know, like knowing these multiple layers, um, you know, maybe there's something you may have learned about how this model could be used to understand environmental health more broadly. I'm seeing a lot of yeses. Okay, good. I'm in good company. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Oh, I gotta know. Hey there, Greg. So nice. Oh, okay, I didn't mean to call you out, but <laughs> it's, it's so great to know. I'm, I'm, I'm glad many of you have heard of it. And I think, I don't know if there's a speaker before me or after um, me that's going to probably also unpack this a little bit more too. Yeah. That would be after. I think that person is next week. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm so glad to know that a lot of um, you all have heard of it um, and, and that maybe some of you are hearing it for the first time uh, because this is definitely um, something um, that I think moving forward because life is so complex <laughs> um, and money is shrinking, we, we really need to find out how we can work together. Um, so as, as those answers are still coming in, and some of you may have already tried to tackle number two, um, how might incorporating the view of this model uh, into the work of what you're already doing in your libraries and community spaces, um, you know, how, how might you incorporate it into perhaps your environmental health literacy work, uh, ideas for health promotion interventions? I don't know if we can bring back the coupon swap, but <laughs> probably not. Uh, I, I'd love to hear if there are persons that may have um, some ideas of something that you're already doing right now. And I see a lot of movement in the chat box. Yeah. Yep. And just to read some of the comment, the comments that are being put in the chat, um, Dr. Jones, um, I think it is difficult to incorporate in the states where legislatures have created a huge roadblocks to providing services and inclusion of all people. Mm. Yes, yes. Um, thank you, thank you for that, Sandy, and and the part of the whole higher up, you know, one of my social ecological models uh, had, you know, the political environment, you know, we were just tackling the, the built 
and uh, the the natural, but but in some spaces that's certainly political and and policy. Um, and I guess that's why we keep it all in the model because we recognize that there's um, there's room for all sectors <laughs> to kind of integrate. Yeah, that's that's important. Another one is I'm in a medical library for a cancer center, oncology library, and have been working closely with the screening and prevention team to improve prevention equity in our region. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Another one, I think it's, it's great for health promotion interventions, um, I guess the model. Um, I'm wanting to transition into more health promotion programs, but not sure what that looks like yet. Hmm. Hmm. That's a great question. I wonder if anyone here from our group has made that connection transition so far. Um, I was, I was going to give the example of, uh, or I was going to ask whether you're uh, connected to a university or maybe there's a university in your area. There's a, there's a lot coming in. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah, these are these are all great ideas. Yeah, I, I, someone, I see someone just mentioned the uh, county health locations. I'm assuming that's health departments. I know Baltimore County um, does a partnership with their uh, library system, so they have a lot of trainings and things like that. And they also have community meetings with different community um, uh, organizations throughout the county. So everybody can get together and uh, share resources. Yeah. Yeah, and, and thanks. I, I also see uh, Kate, who says, uh, who talks about her nonprofit community access to ventilation information. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I'm reading backwards. So so Janice, oh, okay. You assist in awareness of PrEP and other, yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Wait, what did that one say? <laughs> oh, I was reading Janice uh, where she says, uh, this is particularly important right now uh, to assist with the awareness of PrEP and other HIV pharmaceuticals available for treatment. Okay. Yeah. Great. Awesome. And there's one that says um, there should be buy-in from library administrators and county health departments for appropriate collaboration. Mm. Mm. Let's see. Uh, And another one is something we're doing in our local library is staff have become certified SNAP application assistants to improve access to resources. The on online application has become um, become a hurdle for people. Mm, yes, yes. Well, this would be a good time to mention too, social workers in libraries. Oh, there are oh, social yeah. workers in libraries. Yes, that's yeah. They yep, have. you know, Pratt and Baltimore County system, but it started over a decade ago in San Francisco. They were the first. Okay, okay, okay. Would that be, you know, like the main Enoch Pratt Library downtown, or is that in all the Enoch Pratt libraries? They they have a rotation. I don't think they okay. have one full time at every branch, but uh -huh. yeah, I think there's like certain days you can go to each location hmm. and see a social worker. Okay. That's pretty amazing. 
Yeah, I am loving all these comments. And I don't know if April, I, I could get a transcript of the chat. And <laughs> sure, I'm saving the chat as we I go. Would. Okay, perfect, perfect. Because I, yeah, so I totally if anyone you, know, you, but... you would like to read aloud would be great for the recording. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, yes, I should, I should. Um, so let's see, where should I start? Well, there, um, thank you all. Keep those coming. I'm, I'm just going to share with those who are at the uh, recording of this that I would probably say the majority of people have heard of the social ecological model before today's session. So that was really good to know. Uh, as we started to dive into um, the second question, um, I found there was, uh, okay, some you already read, <clears throat> and I won't read that one over again. Um, Right, we have we have one person who said um, it just in response to the social uh, worker in libraries. We oh. have a staff member <laughs> with a with a master's in social work at our library, and she's she's amazing at helping people. Oh and, yes, yes, yep. And and Amy says we have a social work intern at our health sciences library. Well, of course yeah. we are, April. <laughs> yeah. I used to be a social worker before becoming a librarian. Oh wow. Wow. And and I love the comment here that says the tree model mentioned fragmentation. If we try this from just a library, our efforts um will be fragmented. So I suppose you're meaning that that if if the library were to do any interventions um, perhaps in isolation, your efforts would still uh, be fragmented. Yeah, I, it, it's, you know, hopefully, um, I don't know if all libraries have partnerships with, say, for example, um, institutions, schools, uh, Churches, public, does, does our public government, uh, public health partner with libraries? Or how, how integrated, I guess, is the libraries within health sectors across, across the state? Has anyone seen that? I think it really depends on, it depends on the, the the state um from you know from my perspective it looks like the you know and this is just my perspective it's like you know we could look for other comments here sure, um, sure. but um you know there's still that you know that that fragmentation as was mentioned before and everybody's working in silos yeah yeah Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw another comment uh, that says, I would second the suggestion to contact local university college for partnerships. And it says, our university has a focus on connecting with local community organizations as part of our outreach strategy to show a statewide impact and to demonstrate the value of university programs to state legislature. I like that. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, and another person says, we must try a multi-sectorial effort with other agencies to avoid reinventing the wheel or miss on opportunities already available from other agencies. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think there are so many things that I'm hearing about now that I'm more community and public facing and outside of the lab, uh, I see a, hear a lot of great things going on. Um, and, and I'm surprised uh, about the number of organizations that may not know about each other, you know? Um, so, so I guess part of, part of my job is um, try to connect the dots. Uh, that's, that's one thing I love to do 
you know, part of having a lot of time on my hands as a kid. I had a lot of connect the dots books. So I've gotten really good at that. Um, and trying to see how that works practically with people and humans <laughs> instead of dots on the paper. Well, Kate put in the chat um, that there, an example of a partnership between a public library and a public health department in a medium-sized Canadian city. Hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, now, Sandy, you, you raise a good point. Uh, who says, uh, I have heard some interesting conversations about librarians not trying to be everything to everyone. We should not be trying to figure out social work jobs, mental health counseling, job services, and we should focus on being librarians. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I hope, um, you know, one of the things I was uh, hoping not to, because I, I know, you know, when you think about all the work that that we have to do, um, you know, maybe maybe the way I should have rephrased this is how how we can all help each other, or you know, if there was librarians who might you know think about some really cool ideas for um, you know contributing to health. How how can we as institutions help libraries to um, get the resources that they need, get the support. If some of the patrons just come and ask them, because, because you're right, I think a lot of people now are looking at libraries as being a lot of different things. <laughs> and, and one thing, you know, we public health scientists, anyone should not, you know, try to um, place any heavy burdens on anyone. Um, but, you know, much of the work that I do with working with communities, whether it's a church, whether it's a school, is I feel we in academia have a lot of a lot of tools that um, if we can just find ways to ask persons, you know, how, how can we best use these? Because um, maybe libraries, communities might have solutions, uh, but through support, and like I said, connecting the hope and the opportunities together, to create those bridges, um, to make everybody's lift a little lighter, hopefully, but thank you for that. We have another question, if you're open to taking a question. I know we're supposed to have discussion, but it can yeah. spark more discussion. So Janice is asking again, um, she says, how can a library be more effective at reaching out to racial and ethnic minority populations and resourceful communities to improve health literacy targeting disease, diseases specific to those populations? Ooh, that's a great question, Janice. Um, and, and by the way, uh, if anyone else too has... <laughs> has any assistance uh, that you have been doing, feel free to jump in. I don't call myself the expert in all of these, but, but thank you for that. So, so how can a library be more effective at reaching out? Um, let's see. Um, Dr. Jones, if I may just jump in a little bit. Oh. One of the things that NNLM does, we don't work, you know, we have, our network is comprised of libraries and community-based organizations um, and faith-based organizations. And as, you know, providing funding for projects, that's part of what, um, what we do is to increase access. We want to increase access to uh, health information, to trustable health information. And um, we want to equip librarians and we have, we have trainings for just that purpose, to equip librarians to, um, you know, be better informed um, on consumer health, um, 
you know, databases like Medline Plus, right, so that they can refer um, their, their patron base to those resources. So that, you know, hopefully that helps a little. But yeah. April, if I might say this, um, this is Janice who's always asking questions. And thank you, Dr. Yes. Jones. For, yes, hi, this, Janice. Is, this is very enlightening. I'm talking or referring rather to when I say resourceful communities, I mean communities that are predominantly white, wealthy, and you, I mean, and for, for example, in my community, only 4% of our population is black or Af black African-American, but we still have the highest, disproportionately so, the highest um, uh, mortality and morbidity rates. The message is not getting to black people. Now, I'm not talking about um, individuals who have low education attainment because um, I would say maybe 85, 90% of African Americans in this community have um, at least a, a, a postgraduate degree and they have very high incomes. But the messaging is not getting to them. And I know this, and then I'll be quiet, because mm -hmm. over two triennial reports, uh, community health reports, the health, the mor morbidity and mortality for uh, African Americans have actually gotten worse. So my thinking is we need to find different avenues, expand what our public health department is already doing, and maybe, and I've even suggested reaching out to our libraries to provide more, more substantive kind of information. But I mean, for those of you who have this experience, what do you do? Yeah. Yeah, thank thank you for your question, Janice. And 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 I real um as as I start to read, you know, some of the statistics, it 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 can be alarming. Um it can be you know, kind of uh, saddening. What I what I have found is I start um you know with with my sphere of influence. And, and, and I guess what, what I mean by that is um, when I hear about a lot of the things that, that are happening, and I'm, I'm kind of a person that always wants to help me roll up my sleeves and, and, and jump in. But then I think about, you know, the capacity of what I can do, maybe the capacity of what perhaps a library can do that are hearing these things from the news and reading about the statistics. Um, you know, you sort of sort of look at the sphere of influence that is right there. So, for example, one thing I was thinking, and what I think April was alluding to, is is this idea of, of partnerships and um, definitely not not feeling alone. So, for my sphere of influence, I know that there's uh, a mixture of homeschoolers, for example, um, with different socioeconomic status, different race, different ethnicities. But the libraries was always kind of like their space, right? Um, for reading, for, for, for gathering. And, and these are people in both affluent communities and non-affluent you know, communities, if that's the word you wanna to try to use. And I wonder if um, it can be overwhelming, it can be disheartening, but but if if starting where where a person is who's in your sphere of influence, what is that target population that's that's coming to your library? Finding a little bit more about them because those will be as I'm thinking about you know my public health model of early adopters or or champions if you will that'll now become allies to help you spread the message. Um, uh, because otherwise it, it, it will seem really, really challenging. And, and so what I'm hoping is that, you know, if, if each group or each library kind of take a look at, you know, the target population, who's coming in and, and, and like trying to create partnerships with those persons, with those groups, maybe they belong to churches or schools or organizations that may already 
have some things that then you can partner with. Um, but I certainly, Janice, when you wouldn't go at this alone, I would first try to seek partners that could start with a few patrons um, and, and then maybe spreading to their organizations. And, and, and so that way you can start to build. I don't know if that was helpful, but <laughs> just kind of breaking, breaking down the larger issue into something small and bite-sized that hopefully um, you can create small wins that could create bigger, bigger wins, if that makes sense. Chris mentioned the same thing in the chat. Their most effective outreach program was partnering with other community organizations. But I can see um, how even that could be problematic with the population that Janice had mentioned because, you know, if they're highly educated and, you know, uh, want a, uh, a livable income, they may not be utilizing the library. Um, and then, too, if they are um, with such small numbers, I think the issue then may turn into getting buy-in from the higher-ups of the library or buy-in from those at the local health department because they may not see it as an issue since the numbers are so small. Yeah. Yeah, no, all of, all of those things are definitely, definitely important, and, and it is a challenge, um, but, but I... Yeah, it, it is complex, Janice. I, 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 I take my hat off to you and I hear your heart. Um, I would love to, you know, continue the conversation offline if we could sort of explore together. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's complex. <laughs> so I like to tell people to be a tourist. So you want to reach, do outreach to a community, go into their communities, shop at a local grocery store, check out one, one of the churches of, you know, this population that you're not familiar with, or maybe um, go to a festival even that may be in that, that works with that community, that population you're looking to do outreach to, whether it's just setting up a table or maybe you're, you're going to rub some elbows and just chat some folks up. You learn a lot that way, even just being an observer. Well, thank you all for uh, this um, lively conversation. I think it worked out nicely with uh, our just staying in the same room. So thank you, everyone, for your participation. And I'm going to share my screen one more time. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones, um, for, for, your, uh, for your presentation. You know, if everybody can get your reaction button, get your clapping hands going, that'd be great. Uh, let's see, I'm going to share my screen really. Okay, so to close out, and thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Jones, for your, for your, um, for your presentation. Uh, so wonderful. Um, we are, let's see, I lost my chat. <laughs> okay, so we have, um, uh, yes, thank you, Miranda. The evaluation link is in the chat for your CEs. Um, please join us for our next session, which is on March 19th, and it is called Climate Change and Health, Alaska Addressing Health Inequities. Um, and there, um, there's also a link to the, oh great, um, the link to the session is in the, in the chat. Um, you should also be getting a link in the chat to the um, Social Determinants of Environmental Health Series Guide. And if you want to talk about the series at all or, or, um, or you know, go on X, you can use the hashtag, hashtag, so S-D-O-E-H-24. With that, um, we can, um, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I will stop sharing. And um, everyone have a great afternoon. And Dr. Jones, thank you. Thank you so much again. You are so welcome. And thank you, everybody, for attending and for your questions and comments. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.